Um, so I am here today to talk about our school letter grade, um, which is based on the Arizona accountability system. And um, there's a lot of data that I'm about to share with you. So if you have questions. So. All right, so the school's letter grade is based on the A to F accountability system, um, which is designed to empower our schools to uh, achieve and increase student success in the state. Um, it provides us with feedback about where we're excelling in areas where we might need to focus, and it's required by federal law, so we don't have a choice. Um, and it, there's a lot of different measures that they use to determine our letter grade, and so I'm going to try my best to explain that to you today. So what letter grades did our CFSD schools earn? So here is the letter grade of each of the schools in the district. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, and you can see that we got an A, which is exciting. Um, however, and now I'm going to explain to you how those grades are calculated. So there is 30%, there's a little pie chart with some descriptors, but it's also at the top. So um, the student proficiency is 30% of the score. Um, our English language learning <coughs> their growth and proficiency is 10%. Um, acceleration and readiness measures, which I'm going to share those with you, what those are, and then student growth. So that totals the 100% of our possible points, and then I'm going to show you how we did those. So this is our overall score. This is kind of our state report card, okay? And so I'm going to talk about each of these areas. You can see that we earned 87 points this year um, in total. And I'm going to explain a little bit about each and talk to you about how it compares to how we did last year. For those of you who don't know, last year we had a B letter grade. So um, the proficiency or stability proficiency score, um, last year we were 1.65% lower. So our score went up in stability proficiency. So this is, do you see that? Um, the divider between proficiency or stability proficiency, we actually get two scores, one for proficiency and one for stability proficiency, and then they take whichever score is higher, and that's the number of points that you get. So I'll show you that in just a second. Um, growth is 50% of the weight, and we got 42-ish points, and that was 8.4% higher than last year. So that's a good thing. We, have, we had a high level of growth, and I'll explain what that means. Um, this year, we got the 10 points for EL, uh, our English language learner proficiency and growth. Um, that is determined by the number of students that you have in, who are English language learners who have been at the school for a full academic year. Um, and last year, we did not get those points, so that helped. For acceleration and readiness, we got six points, and last year we had 10 points. I'll explain where we're missing points for this year. And then we got three bonus points, and last year we had zero. So you can see where there was um, one category that we didn't score as well in, and um, a little bit at the top, but most of the categories we did better, which would result in a higher grade. Um, last year we had 80 points. So this year we got an A. Hooray! <laughs> okay, so the student proficiency percentage. This is that 30% score. 30% um, of the score. Um, they're looking at um, this, the level of proficiency for the students. And so they're looking at um, English language arts, which is the ELA, and the math scores for each grade level and then they determine your total proficiency points based on your um, number of students who are proficient. Um, each of those scores is weighted. So if students are minimally proficient or falls far below, they get, you get zero points for that. If they're partially proficient, you get um, 0.6 points. And if they're proficient, they get, you get one point. And if they're exceeding, you get a little over one point. <laughs> Yeah. Now, when you say this on math and English language, now is that on grades or is that on the 
Uh, testing. Oops, did I fast forward yeah. slide? Sorry. Um, that's by grade level, grade three. But I mean, are, is the number based on kids' grades that they're getting or by testing scores? That's uh, 100% percent on the ACN. Okay, okay. That's, that's what I was trying to put. It's on the okay. test scores. Got it. Mm -hmm. But they're looking at, they're, they're not, it's not based 100, like they don't want to say it's only based on the easy merit because it's also based on, we get points for our science assessment that they take, the AIM science. We get points for things like attendance. We get points for growth, which isn't necessarily proficiency. And I'll show that. So only this section then is 100% the testing. Is that correct? Then? Yes, right. Okay. Okay. Most of it is the testing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be real. That's Most of it is suggesting. Um, okay, so then they so that was the proficiency percentage. And remember, I told you they're going to take of these two scores, proficiency or stability. They take the one that has the higher score, and that's what you get. So that, this is our um, stability percentage. So where it says F A Y on the screen, that's a full academic year. So we're looking at, if you look, start at the bottom and look at students who are only at Ventana Vista for one academic year, um, you can see how they did proficiency-wise. You can look at students who have been here two academic years and students who have been here three academic years and their performance. So our stability, so that's how they factor the stability <coughs> score. And you can see the longer students are here, the more likely they are to be proficient. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't make that any smaller or got weird, so I had to put it on. But um, this is our ELL, um, our English Language Learners Growth and Proficiency, and our English Language Learners um, did quite well. You have to have more than 20 English Language Learners to qualify for these points, and they have to be there for a full academic year. So we have some challenges with that. Last year we didn't get any of these points. We had more than 20 ELL students last year, but they weren't here for a full academic year. Um, so we have, um, last year we just happened to have more kids who stayed the full year. And so we got those points this year. Um, if you don't get these points, then your total amount possible is only out of 90 points. And some of our other elementary schools don't get the points because they don't have enough students. So it doesn't hurt you if you don't have enough students because then the pie shrinks. Yeah. The, the, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. That's what I think I heard you say. Yeah, so yeah. You, like last year we didn't get the points, but our total was out of 90 right. instead of out of 100. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and these are the acceleration and readiness points that we earned this year. So um, we, so these are how the points are determined, these different categories. Grades five through eight who are taking high school math for credit. So we don't have any fifth graders who are taking algebra or geometry. So we don't get those points. Okay. We have some fifth graders who are taking seventh grade math at the middle school, um, but they're not in algebra yet. So we don't have any points for that. Um, the second category, which is the students who, um, the grade three students, ELA minimally proficient, that is if we reduce the percentage of third graders who are minimally proficient. And we did not get the points for that. So our number of students who are minimally proficient in third grade was a little bit higher this year. So that's something we have to look at. What are we going to do about that particular item? Who are the students and where can we intervene? Um, the, sorry, I just need to scroll this down. Um, the third category is about chronic absenteeism. If you don't reduce your absenteeism, you don't get the two points. So attendance is critical. And you've heard me saying this on um, my video newsletter and also just anything I'm pushing out. Um, we have not strong attendance at the school. And it's not because we're not able to bring our kids to school, it's because we're choosing not to. <laughs> we're choosing to schedule vacations when we have school days. We're choosing to take days off for, um, I had kids yesterday who called in and said they were um, planning a party for a family member and that's why they couldn't come to school yesterday. Um, there is a menagerie of reasons people don't bring their kids to school. Um, most of them have nothing to do with not being able to get their kids to school. Um, 
obviously we know kids get sick, um, but more of our illnesses are not about, I mean our absences are not about illnesses. They're more about just a choice, not making it a priority. So that's something that if you can communicate out to your friends about scheduling vacations when we actually have vacations rather than going the week before we have a vacation and or the week after we have a vacation, that would be fantastic because the two points make a big difference. It can push you um, into a different category. And one of our schools got a B rating because they were less than two points short and they did not get those absenteeism points. So it's something to be mindful of if you can. Um, the <coughs> subgroup improvement and special ed, the subgroup improvement, we got six points. Um, last year we did not get that many points, so we did a lot of growth in those categories. We have 10 different subgroups. Um, they can be things like um, if they're in special education, receiving special education services, not inclusion services necessarily, but um, if they have a specific learning disability. So they're looking at how those different categories of students are performing on the assessments. And so our subgroup categories did quite well. So we got those points. Um, sorry. Problems with user on screen. Um, and then for the inclusion students, um, it's related to the state average of how many special education students and inclusion you have in the general education environment. Um, and so we didn't have enough students to um, put us above the state average. And so we don't get those points. Do I have that correct? I'm looking so, at you, but I think, so. I think that's correct. So um, that's one I'm a little fuzzy on. Um, okay, so absenteeism would be great if we could get those two extra points. Okay, so this is um, how they determine growth, and this is probably a lot of data, um, probably more than you want to consume, but I will just share a little bit of it to try to explain the categories. I'm actually going to stand up for a second and show you. Sorry, I'm going to stand right in front of you guys probably, but... Um, so basically, you're looking for, for growth. You're looking at how they did in the previous school year, okay? And then if they had low growth, average growth or high growth. So they're comparing how they did in the previous school year with how they did in this school year. And um, so a student can be highly proficient, get a four, but still have low growth. So 7% of our students who had a four last year had low growth. They could still have a four this year. They could still be exceeding proficiency, but they didn't grow enough compared to the previous year. So it's an interesting data point for us to look at, actually, and I'll show you a graphic here in just a minute, but um, so you can see that's a high-performing student who just didn't make enough growth. I mean, here's a student, this was a student who was minimally proficient last year, and we had 8.2% of those students make high growth. They might still be a one. They might still be minimally proficient, but based on their previous year's score, they made a great deal of growth. Does that make sense? So they're, they're not only just watching what their 4, 3, 2, 1 score is, but they're also looking at their actual scale score on the assessment and watching are they making a year's growth in a year's time. So any of the students in the middle category are making a year's growth in a year's time. But they take all of that information into consideration when they're determining our score. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is over here in the math growth score, um, we had a lot of high growth in mathematics. And I, I think that's, important to point out because it's something we've been working in our school improvement plan is improving math instruction, communicating with families about math instruction, um, and having kids work at a higher level of math understanding rather than just memorizing algorithms and math facts. And so that's something that is important to the staff. They will be very happy to see that. <laughs> okay, um, this is another um, data point which they're looking at your growth target. So they set a score for every student. So any third grader who took the test last year has a target score for fourth grade. 
Okay, so this is the year before. So any of the kids who were in third grade two years ago had a target score for fourth grade. And then you're looking at, did they go below their target, at their target, or exceed their target? So it's similar to the other one, but they're actually looking at, in relationship to their target, how they did. So students who got within 10, plus or minus 10 of their target, made at or near the target. Kids who got more than that, were over and exceeds, and kids who were lower than 10 points to their target were in the low category. And just out of curiosity, what determines the target? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I actually don't know. I mean, I don't know how they determine the target. Some random It doesn't correlate to the percentages on the prior chart that you had at all of percentage of growth from the last year. Their, their target isn't a percentage of growth from the last year. So, um, so this, yeah, the growth percent is actually different. There are two different oh, okay. scores. There's growth percentage and or percentile, and then there's, oops, and then there's growth towards the target. I'm going to show you in just a second after this. So um, these are these are areas that we have to look at. So in English language arts, we had a high percentage of our students at 14% had low, like didn't they were below their target. So we have to look at that and go, okay, why is it that our students weren't making a year's growth in a year's time? What's, what's going on with that piece? We also can look at, um, in math, where we had students who, we have a big category of students who were partially proficient last year who still made low growth. So these are things that inform us to help us move forward in our work. And we can look at specific students. But this is how, this is the answer to your question. This is how those two things interface together. So um, down below is we basically have three years to get a student from being minimally proficient or partially proficient to being proficient. Okay, And so that's why they set those growth targets, because they want to keep the kids moving up. And so you, we have to catch up. So kids are either catch up, keep up, or stay up. <laughs> so the kids who are getting fours have to stay up. So they have to keep growing and stay up in that category. And the kids who are proficient need to keep up or move up, right? You either want them to move into exceeding or just stay right where they are. But the kids who are in these two categories have a lot more distance to grow. And so that's why they're setting those targets so that you have an idea of how the students are doing. Otherwise, if we don't look closely at it, we just go, oh yeah, they got a four, that's great. Oh yeah, they got a three. And that doesn't really help you know how the students are really doing, especially when we're looking at kids who stay in the same category but are making low growth. Because what happens is those kids can drop down into the lower category. So you have to pay close attention to that. Okay, and so here's an example of what we do with the data. Um, I, it doesn't have any students' names on it, but it's showing you, like, this is their score, like the score you see as a parent. They got a three last year. They got a three this year. This particular student made average growth. But if you look over in the far column where it says minus 14, they were below their target by 14 points. You can see we had students who were in the four making average growth and who met their target. That's all the green. We can see here a student who was who went from a one to a three. That's a significant growth, right? We caught up from being minimum, like below proficiency to being proficient. Here's another student who moved up, who had high growth. Can you guys read the words on it? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you can see down here we had a student who went from a three to a one. So obviously low growth, right? And then they didn't meet their target. And we have a kid who went from a two to a one, or a three to a two. Ooh, what just, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I did, but it just got markedly smaller. Okay, well, we're almost done, so it's okay. So anyways, what does this mean for us? It just means what we have to look at the data and, and determine a plan for when we, because I have a list with the names on it, so I can look at a student who went from a three to a one and have conversation with their teachers. We really have a limited amount of impact 
from the scoring that we can focus on because our fifth graders are gone. So their data helps the middle school, but it doesn't really help us anymore. Our current third graders have no data because they haven't taken a test. So it's really, we have to focus on our fourth and fifth graders this year to help make a difference. And so that's what I do with the teachers. We'll be looking at the data and making plans for what we're going to do for those particular kids. Yes? Are the parents brought into that conversation or only if you feel like it, the teacher feels like it's necessary? Like if they're a low scoring child on this test? On this particular test, we don't really engage much with the parents with specific child parent as this assessment data, but obviously there's other assessment data that we take into consideration. So there's a student on here who went, the student that went from a three to a one, but in their classroom they're performing, on our district assessments they're performing. I don't know what happened. Maybe they just didn't have the stamina that, that day. What? Maybe they had a headache that day. Yeah, I mean, we don't, we don't really know, you know, and it's an eight-year-old taking a very, comprehensive online assessment. With, there's a lot of stuff going on on the test. There are windows that go up and down on this side and boxes that click on this side. There's a lot that they have to manage on a screen. Um, that for us is okay, but then go back and say, this is an eight-year-old managing all of these things. And then the questions, the way you answer the questions are all very different. Um, and they, the kids do take practice assessments so they get familiar with the buttons and the things that they have to do. But then in the moment, you know. And we also have kids who don't do very well in the classroom in terms of their classroom performance and district assessments, and then they'll do outstanding on this assessment. So, you know, that information is information we can use, but it's not really something that, about the state test, we're not really meeting with parents about that, because it's just one data point. But it does help us with our work. You know, I can look by teacher, if I have a teacher who's, um, doing very well, their students are high growth students, and we can examine what is that teacher doing that's contributing to this. Likewise, if we have a teacher who has several low growth students, we might have a conversation about what that looks like. Why is it only low growth in math, but not in ELA? You know, so it does inform our work. But when you say those kids, you're not talking about those particular kids, you're talking about that group of kids and yeah. how you approach There's them. all different kinds of ways we look at it. But there are some of just very particular kids. We can look at kids who are on the cusp of moving up from a two to a three, or kids who are on the cusp of moving down from a three to a two, and really try to intervene, intervene in some way that helps them get over the hump. I mean, it can't be in relation to the assessment, because that's not it. But we can focus on what's going on with this child, where are the areas that they have gaps that we can try to shore up so when they get to the assessment that they can up and not fall down. Okay. Um, so anyways, we're going to celebrate our success. We're happy that we have an A. That's exciting. The A is great. But it doesn't really define who we are, right? I mean, I just want to make that clear. Like, yeah, we got an A. Last year we got a B. It's a very slippery slope. <laughs> Next year we could be a B. Um, based on that the way they calculate the points, you can see that, you know. Even if we have a student who, students who are in the four, if they have low growth, we're not getting those points, right? If we have, if we don't improve our absenteeism, we're not gonna get those points. If we don't have our ELL students make enough growth, we don't get those points. You know, so it's always just, it is just what it is. <laughs> but it's just that we don't wanna let that define us. Like I don't, it's, it just is what it is. So, um, anyways, we're proud to be at Ventana Vista. Um, we have lots of amazing families. We have robotics work where we're working on communication and collaboration. PE is great. We have specials, right? Art is creative and engaging. Um, we have student council that helps us develop leaders. And we hope that you guys are proud to be at Ventana Vista. So, do you guys have any questions? Uh, so with the Spanish Immersion Program, I know it's usually said that by third grade they're kind of giving out and then they accelerate. Have you noticed, or is there a way to, to kind of differentiate those students from everyone else? Is there any difference in the grades? Um, yes, but I don't have that specific data here. Um, our World Languages, uh, what is our Global Citizens Director, <laughs> 
she really parses out that data and follow, tracks that data about how our immersion students and our um, non-immersion students are performing. I can sort it by class. Do you know how it like, trends? Does it, is there a big difference or is it pretty much the same? There is a difference. 